Hi, today we're talking about interactive and animated plots. Here's our weekly roadmap. Last week we talked about exploratory data analysis, and next week we're going to move on to mapping. Uh, but for now, let's look at how to make our plots move. Our plan for today is to do something basic. We're going to take ggplot2 objects that we've learned how to make already, and we're going to uh, turn them into interactive plots and animated plots using two packages, uh, the Plotly package and the ggAnimate package. Along the way, we're going to learn how to take our output and uh, make it go to a simple, flat website. Yes, in the course of uh, just one hour, we're going to animate our plots, we're going to make them interactive, and we're going to make a website just for kicks. Our plot inspiration uh, uh, for today comes from Bobby Johnson. This is a bar chart uh, race to the top that you've probably seen online before. Now this is a race you don't want to win because it's the cumulative uh, case count here and of course the U.S. is off to a racing start here by early April. Uh, we're going to try to uh, reproduce this plot which I believe was made in uh, Flourish. We're going to try to do something like this in R. Not a complete replication uh, but uh, here's a video file of, of what we're going to try to do today ticking through the days, seeing our country sort of race up this uh, ladder, going a little bit slower than the previous version. But we could go in and we could tweak all of these to make it look more and more uh, like the original. But I think this is what we're going to get to by the end of the session. So let's start with interactive plots. The Plotly package makes it so super easy. Now the, the, the Plotly is a library, a plotting library for Python, R, and Julia. And in R we can use the Plotly package and we can write kind of in base Plotly, I guess you could call it, to create a map that uh, is interactive, a chart that is interactive. So here we go, here's our basic uh, plot and we can interact with our uh, plot, we can tooltip over it, we can download a PNG, and a few other fun, fancy things to make a, a plot that's explorable. But, but there's an even easier way to do it if you don't know that code. You can just make a ggplot object. Let me click it back to the original here. You can make a ggplot static object and then use the function ggplotly to make it interactive. And that's what we've done here. So we can tooltip over this, we can zoom in, it's fully interactive, it's embedded here in our slides. Uh, and the only thing we did that's different from any other previous week is we ran the function ggplotly. So super easy. So after I show you how to make interactive plots, we're going to look at uh, how to make our plots move, how to make animated plots. And the ggAnimate package, uh, an extension for ggplot2, makes this incredibly easy as well. Uh, the steps are to one, create a plot as we've been doing for a few weeks now, to then add on something else to that plot that's one of these transition states, basically to say how to split up the, the, the plot into different frames. And then from here, it's just making the plot look more and more like we want it to look. The Ease AES deals with uh, the transition aesthetics, how that looks. Uh, glue is going to help us with some uh, frame labels. And then if we wanted, we could further mess around with parameters like uh, uh, enter and exit to make the uh, animation flow more like what we might want it to look like. So here's some sample data, the Iris data set built in. You've probably seen this a hundred times by now. Uh, and uh, it's a few different species here that we're going to plot. So the process is simple, right? We start with our static plot and we're going to load the ggAnimate library. We're going to make a call to ggplot. Here is our iris, the built-in data set. We're going to map width to the x-axis. We're going to map length to the y-axis. And then we're going to add our geome. It's going to be a, a points, right? And we're going to save this all to uh, the object P. So we're creating a new object called P. This is our static plot. And then to this object P, we're going to add transition states. So the transition states are going to transition by species. And we're going to save all of this to the um, anim object. So here we go, our plot is animating itself through these three different species groups. Uh, from uh, uh, one, to two, and of course to three. Now if we want to change how this animation uh, uh, looks, here's where our ease AES uh, parameter comes in. Now it's cubic in out. Uh, uh, 
it's 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 uh, there's a few options that, that we can pick from. I did not know what cubic in out meant when I created this graph. I tried a few and this is the one that looked the best. And what does it do is it's making it a little bit more elastic. If you go back to the previous uh, mode of transition, the current one now with this ease AES makes everything a little bit more springy, uh, I guess you could say as, uh, as the look for the animation, right? And here we are finally adding um, uh, um, some labels up here into our title and our subtitle. We're doing our frame count. We're doing our species as it's changing. Uh, now for us, this week, we're going to be showing the label of days, January 22nd, January 23rd, 24th. So that's what we're going to be working with. Uh, but the way you do it is by putting a few placeholders in uh, these, these title parameters that you're used to working with at this point. And finally, uh, we're going to learn how to do these two, uh, th these two functions, use these two functions in the context of an R Markdown website. Now, uh, this is perfect, they say, for scientific and technical writing uh, using things that are native to the web. Uh, it, it really is such a simple website format to use. It's a flat website, so there's not much upkeep needed. Uh, there's a limit to what it can do, but it's perfect for uh, academic websites, uh, for uh, websites for a paper that you might be writing, uh, and for a tutorial that you might be creating. It's an easy way to get started with uh, putting your work onto the web. So we're gonna learn how to create a distill website. So let's jump over into our studio. And <clears throat> you're gonna see some files here in my website, uh, in this directory, my website. And I don't think you'll see any uh, uh, files open here on the top. To get everything up here, uh, sorry, just a little bit of cleanup, uh, we're going to start with the index.rmd file. Um, and so the way you're going to find that file is to go into, um, under project here, go into my website, and you're going to see all of the files that were created when I ran just two lines of code. So when I set up this project, I took these two lines, calling the package to still, and then using the function create website. And by running these two lines, uh, R created all the files I need for the website that we're building for today. It is that simple. And uh, when I did that in project, it created a directory called my website, because that's why I told it to create. And in here, you see it created most of the files uh, that you're looking at over here. I create, I added a few myself. Uh, the main page, the landing page, is this index.rmd. Uh, you'll recognize uh, the layout. At the top, we have our metadata, our YAML heading here. And then we're mixing in some code chunks with some writing. And our YAML heading is giving our page uh, a title, our website a title, and a description that someone kind of sees in the header banner. And um, then we are then I'm showing here just some basic text on the page. Let me click knit so that you can see what this looks like. So here's my basic website. Here's the landing page, right? It's my home page. I have an about page already in here as well. So we'll click back to home. Uh, here's my title, my website, welcome to this website. Uh, and here's where I'm mixing. Uh, uh, some, some code that I'm not actually running with some other pros. Now you notice that uh, the color here is, the, is a special kind of blue and the fonts look nice. I hope you think they look nice. Uh, I modified those a little bit. And I modified them uh, in the YAML file here. I'm going to take away a piece and let you just see. I'll come back and explain it. But I'm going to take away a piece and let you see what it looks like for the default website that, that, that uh, R, R makes for you. When you run those two lines that I ran, this is what you get for a website, right? And it still looks pretty nice. Uh, uh, but I wanted to make a few changes. So uh, I came into this uh, uh, YAML file. Uh, this is kind of my instructions for the site. And I added... Uh, uh, a call to CSS down here, and I created this CSS file, the styles.css, and I added a few details here that tell the website 
what it should look like and what types of fonts should be used. If you've done any web authoring, uh, you're familiar with CSS. I'm not. So where did I learn about this? Well, I, I looked on the Distill website. It showed how to modify the CSS for most things that you want to do. And I looked up a few examples of adding Google fonts to CSS. That's it. And I copied and pasted and I hit knit a few times until it looked the way I wanted it to look. And I came here to the metadata and I said, uh, just put CSS here and call the CSS file that I just created. And then when I run this, when I knit this together now, it's overriding the default options for color and font and it's giving the color and font that I want for my website. So that's pretty easy. In the About tab, uh, this is on another page. I have another RMD page that the R is going to convert for me into an HTML file. At the top, I'm going to say about this site and some additional details about the website. And here, you see I'm mixing my pros with some code. And the code that I have here is adding a basic Plotly plot, an interactive plot based on the MT Cars data set. Right? So if I run this here, you can see that this is the, the plot that we're going to create. And if I knit this all together, I can see on my uh, about page here uh, is my text. Here's the code that I wrote. I wanted to show it to my readers. And here's the interactive plot. And I have tooltips. I can dive in. And I, and I can modify all of this much further. If I wanted, I could a reader could download the plot as a PNG, uh, PNG file, an image file. Uh, but all of this, with just a few lines of code, I have a multi-page website where I'm combining my writing and my analysis, and it all just knits together so cleanly. When you first run the, uh, when you first run those two lines of code to create your website, uh, it doesn't create, of course, week five RMD. That's a special uh, page that I've created for today. And uh, in the navigation instructions, you won't see this here. Right? If, I, if I just take that away and run again for a moment, you're going to see that the default website uh, doesn't have uh, week five here. So you get these two uh, pages over here to the right. But you can have it look um, however you'd like it to look. Uh, and I'm adding, I want some uh, uh, I want some links that are left justified. I'm going to call it week five. And then on the home, sorry, on the right, I want my home button and my about button sort of right justified. And uh, I put the text here and I want it to say week five. I could have it say whatever I wanted up there in the navigation bar. And it's going to open up the week five HTML. Uh, now, how do I get an HTML file? I don't know how to write HTML. Uh, well, I don't have to because R is going to do it for me as soon as I make this RMD file called week five. And this is the file we're going to work in to uh, learn how to make our plots for today. I'm going to go ahead and hit knit on this, and it's going to interrupt us as we get going. Uh, there's a few things that take a while to run, so I'm going to knit that. And now let me tell you about uh, what we're going to do for today. Uh, we need a few packages. Uh, uh, go ahead and run this, uh, run this chunk to load some packages for uh, our exploration today. Uh, if, if for GG Animate uh, to make GIF files, you need the GIFSKI package, and uh, to make movie files, you need the AV package. So go ahead, and if you're on your own computer and you're not running this in our Studio Cloud, uh, grab this line of code, copy it, and run it in the console to make sure you install these packages. But otherwise, everything should be ready to go for you. Uh, I've also left a few breadcrumbs here. I, I abandoned my attempt to make it look exactly like Bobby's where the flags are embedded in the bars, but there is a way to do it. And if you wanted to explore that option, you could try here uh, with the GG flags package and the country code package. Let's start though with an interactive plot using Plotly. Now, if we go back to week one, we can create a static version of the plot we want to look at. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and run this so you remember what, what plot we're talking about here. Remember this plot from week one? Uh, I'll uh, pop, it, uh, pop it out here so you can see it a little bit better. So here we go. We have our 538 theme. 
uh, sorry, I, I took away our 538 theme. Uh, this is just a basic uh, line plot here uh, with daily deaths with uh, coronavirus, and it's doing a uh, rolling mean here, I believe. Uh, but this is all the plot we, the, the code we saw in, uh, in week one. Actually, I don't think a rolling mean is involved in that. Uh, now that I now I think about it, uh, but we're going to grab our data, right from the New York Times site. We're going to call it New York Times underscore st. We're going to do some wrangling to our data, and we're get going to get our plot p. I'm not going to go through this because this is what we did in week one. But the end result of this is uh, this plot. Now we're going to take this and we're going to animate it. And there is one line of code we need to run, ggplotly. So we're going to pass p to that. And when we, uh, when we run that chunk, now we have a plot that is fully interactive. Now, if we wanted, we could go back to this and we could add uh, additional parameters and uh, specify what these colors should be, what should be in these boxes when we hover over it. But the point is that it's an interactive plot that we can uh, zoom into and take a further look at. And when we knit this page, because uh, R is ready to show us what our page looks like, uh, here's what uh, here's what week five week week five the week five page looks like. Uh, we have a table of contents because we asked for one that has two levels of headings. Uh, we have our heading here that says interactive plot with Plotly. We have our week one plot, and now we have our interactive plot uh, uh, just by running ggplotly on the static object P. Right, pretty pretty slick how it does that. Uh, I should note that in the uh, YAML heading, uh, we did do something different to get those uh, table of contents. Uh, we just told it that uh, we, in, in addition to a title and a description, is that we wanted a TOC. We wanted a table of contents. That's true, and we wanted it to have a depth of two. And and you can see in the page, unlike the other pages we've looked at so far. Our week five, our week five page has a has a table of contents. All right, so uh, making an interactive plot is as easy as running the plot the function ggplotly. So we've done that. We've embedded it into our website. Now let's take the slightly harder one and look at how to animate a plot with gganimate. And uh, again, our inspiration here is coming from Bobby Johnson writing in the MIT Technology Review. The code you see here, which this looks like gibberish, is actually the embed code for a tweet that I sent, asking people, you know, what is your favorite uh, COVID interactive uh, or animated plot? And so all of this gibberish code, when it's rendered, uh, uh, embeds my tweet here about Bobby's chart, and of course I don't I don't know most of the things that are in this gibberish code. I don't need to. I just went to Twitter's web page. I grabbed uh, the embed code and I pasted it here because the nice thing is we're making a website and R knows how to deal with all of that code just to embed something in a web page without me having to know how to do any of it. So to remind you of what this uh, uh, race to the chart. A race to the top chart looks like this is what we're trying to recreate here. This is our goal. So the first thing we need to do uh, is to get the get the data and take a look at it. Now this is data we worked with in week three, so it should be somewhat familiar to you. I'm going to run this chunk, and what this is going to do is it's going to grab the data, right? Read CSV. It's going to go out to GitHub, grab the data, and save it in its wide format into cases wide. Uh, here, all I'm doing is showing you. I'm not manipulating the data. I'm just really showing you uh, a slice of the data. So take my data and then slice it, show you rows 1 to 10, select columns. I only want to show you five columns. There are many other date columns. We're only going to show you columns 1 to 5 here. And then we're going to use the cable and cable styling functions to make it look nice. And when I render the page, here's the code that I'm uh, echoing back for my readers. And here's my nice, simply styled table that shows five variables and 10 rows. Right, it's only showing the first of all of my many date columns here. I can also, if I wanted in my environment, open up cases wide. And you can see that it uh, is, has 266 observations by uh, all 107 variables. So I have so many days. Right, each day has its own column 
of data. So I have my data in, uh, but you'll recall from all the weeks up to this point that we're not really going to work with wide data very much when we go to plot and do these analyses. We need to get into a, a long format. And that's what we're going to do in the next step. Uh, yeah, again, this is code you've seen, so I'm going to go through it a little bit quickly. But we're going to take all of this, everything here is our pipeline, and we're going to take the result of this pipeline and save it to an object called cases. So we're going to make a long version of this cases wide. Uh, to do this, we just need to do a few things. We're going to get rid of the latitude and longitude columns, right? So it's a negative select. We want to select these columns out of our data set. And uh, we need to uh, aggregate our data at the country level for some countries, like Australia, where uh, they have province level data. There is no overall Australian number, so we need to create one. We have uh, Australia is broken down into its provinces, so we need to add up all the province level data. So what we're going to do to be able to, to get that is we're going to group by country. So we're going to say everything within Australia. Uh, take all the variables that start with X. Those are the variables that have our case data. And uh, basically for all of these values here in the X1 2220, right, January 22nd, 2020, we're going to add up all these values for Australia, which are all zeros. And it happens to be that way for the first bunch of days. But once we get out here, if we add up all of these, it'll be 4 plus 1 um, plus all the zeros is 5. right? So uh, we will group by country, group, group by country, and then do some summing for every variable by that group. So I'll do that real quick. And what you'll see here is now I uh, have my data for Australia here. I'll click down so you can see most of Australia. And all of the values for Australia are now the same because I've summed across all of the values. And just for every cell for Australia, for every day cell, uh, it just has the same value. So my data are now redundant for Australia. I've been able to sum at the country level, but now I don't need all those copies of Australia's data. Right. I, uh, I only want to keep one of the copies. It doesn't matter which one. They're all the same. So I'm going to use the distinct function to keep the first copy of Australia's data. And uh, I have the keep all uh, parameter here set to true so that it doesn't drop all of my other columns. If I don't do that, what happens is if I run just through here, you're going to see that I'm just going to get a unique list of the country names. So it's going to show me every uh, country name with no repetition but no other data, right? It's dropped the rest of my data set. So I need to keep all set to true so that instead what I get is only countries appearing once, right? Now Australia only appears once, not multiple times. Uh, it has the data for the Australian capital territory, but it's repeated for all the territory, all of the provinces. So this data, this column here, province state is useless to me now. It doesn't carry any information. But my data set consists of all countries represented once and all of the days of their data. So I can scroll up and I can also say, let's get rid of the province state column. I don't need it anymore. And then we're going to pivot longer. We're going to take this data set and we're going to make it into a long by looking for the variables that start with X. We're going to put those uh, dates that you see in the headings. We're going to put all of this into uh, its own column called date. And we're going to take our case level data and put it into a column called cases. And when we do that, uh, R still thinks, we're not quite done with it, because R now thinks that um, my date column is a character string. It thinks it's just 1.22.20. It doesn't know that I mean January 22nd, 2020. So we need to turn this character into a date. And we're going to do that using the MDY, the month, day, year function in the Luberdate package. Uh, because it's in the format month, day, year. And Luberdate will help us to parse this string into a date to tell it that it's, it's actually January 22nd, 2020. So we're going to mutate. We're going to write over our date and turn it into the month, day, year version of date. And while we're here, just to clean up a little bit, we're going to turn country region into just country. And uh, we have data on the Diamond Princess, which is that cruise ship that had uh, a lot of infected passengers early on 
in the US pandemic. And so we're gonna get rid of their data. And then I'm gonna slice it and show you just what it looks like. So I'm gonna run this chunk. And now I have a long data set. Afghanistan appears here, the 22nd, 23rd, 24th. I have all of my case data. Uh, now I have a data set that I can work with. The next obstacle that I come across though is uh, that if, if we go back to the, um, the goal for today, you see that every, every day only 10 countries appear. The 10 uh, uh, countries with the highest level of cases on that day. So if you think about what we're doing, uh, we're gonna take all of the data we have, divide it up by day, create a different chart by day, and then stitch all those charts together into an animation. And it's gonna look like they're racing. But to do that, of course, we need to be able to say on February 22nd, which are the 10 countries that we should include, right? And we're gonna rank them from the highest to the lowest. And so we should include the 10 highest countries. But you can see sometimes, certainly early on, uh, some of our countries have uh, the same values. So I had a couple 12s, a couple 11s, a couple, so they're sort of essentially tied in their ranks. So uh, what are we gonna do about that? But we need to figure out how to get 10 countries per day. That's our next challenge. So to do that, uh, anytime we're doing something by something, we probably need to use the group by function. So we're gonna start with our long data set. We're gonna group by date, and then uh, we're gonna create a rank. So let me do that real quick with leaderboard here to show you what it looks like. We're gonna use the rank function. And now I have a new object called leaderboard. And it's organized here by country, by date, and I can see uh, on January 22nd, Afghanistan's rank was 96.5. Uh, it, it had zero cases on this date, so it was tied with many other countries uh, quite early on. So what I can do is I can also take leaderboard, I'm gonna change the arrangement here, leaderboard, and I wanna sort by date, and uh, instead of by country, and then I wanna sort by rank descending. So if I do this, now it's going to show me, um, oh, I wanna do ascending by rank. I don't wanna go from the, the lowest, I wanna go from the highest down, from one to two to three. So take that away. So here, now we see on January 22nd, China was, uh, was the sole occupant of the first rank, followed by uh, Japan and Thailand with two cases, they were both tied, and then uh, South Korea, Taiwan, and the US with one case each, still on the 22nd of, of January. And then every other country uh, was tied for zero, right? And uh, if we go back, what did Bobby do? How did he deal with these ties, especially early on? And if we, uh, if we let this spin forward, what you're gonna see is that um, in the beginning, oh, we sort of missed it there. In the beginning, the, um, uh, the default position was alphabetical. So if you were tied for zero, the way that you made it into the top 10 uh, in the beginning was your country started with an A, essentially. So you'll see it come up here again. We'll spin through them. And Albania, Algeria, Andorra, they, uh, and Afghanistan, they all have zeros. So they're not ranked any higher than the other countries that also have zeros to begin with but the default position is to take the uh, alphabetical order if they're tied. So that's what we're gonna try to do is to go by ranking and then when they're tied and we need to break the tie, we're gonna use alphabetical order. So to do that, we can, uh, we created our leaderboard with our rank here and we're gonna sort this by rank and by country and we're gonna um, give new ranks. Let me, let me run this first part here so you can see what I'm, what the arrange does. So here we go, we're arranging country uh, by, uh, uh, rank by country. And then um, we're going to, we're still grouping by uh, date. So within each date, we're gonna give a rank from uh, one to one to N. 
So if we do that, China in all of these days is always ranked number one in the very beginning. Let's see if we can click through to see. What's the best way to show this? Uh, so we'll make our let's make our leaderboard uh, object again. And now that we've given the new ranks, let's just run it over here. We create our object called leaderboard, and we will uh, arrange leaderboard by uh, date, and then by uh, uh, rank. Let's take a look at this. So now, you can see that on the 22nd, we've arranged, uh, we've given new ranks, right, 1 to 10 by day, by original rank, and then where there were ties, we uh, fell back onto the alphabetical ordering of the countries. So now, rather than having a rank of 97 or whatever Afghanistan had, it's rank number 7 because it now entered the tie. It was tied with zero cases with many countries, but it was the first country, A, F, G, to appear in the list. So after six comes seven, and then the next country alphabetically was Albania. So it gets eight, and then nine, and then 10. So we're still working here by date, and we're assigning this uh, new rank from one to 10. And we're gonna filter our ranks to only have uh, uh, we're going to get rid of all of the countries that are ranked above 10 for any particular day because in our chart for January 22nd, we're only going to plot those 10 countries. So if your rank for that day is over 10, we don't need you. We're going to get rid of it. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to create a variable uh, called month day that is going to be, uh, it's going to take the date. It's going to grab what month this is from the date. It's going to grab what day it is and it's going to give it a, a, a label. So let me show you what that looks like. So here we go. We have uh, our new variable at the end, January 22nd. And what it's doing is it's pasting the month and the day. So what we can do to see what this looks like, uh, if we run each piece individually and we say uh, mutate, uh, cases, right, our cases data set, and uh, we want month to equal this piece here. Oh. What it's doing is is extracting the month from the uh, from our date. The next piece, if we add in the day, we're creating another variable called day and it's going to extract the day extract the day from the date so now we have month and day January 22nd and the last call we're going to make what it's doing is it's pasting them together so this function paste says take the month column and paste it together with the day column and put a space in between them So now we have January space 22nd, January space 23rd. If you're an Excel user and you've used concatenate, that's what the paste function is doing for you. And if you wanted, and you didn't want it to be a space, it could be a dash, for instance. And now we have January dash 22nd. The last thing we're gonna do for our, uh, uh, to help in our plotting is we need a list of all of the days that are in our data set. So what we're gonna do, uh, let's go ahead and create this leaderboard object. Oh, and oh, yeah, let's create this leaderboard object. So now we have leaderboard here with uh, 1,030 uh, observations. And uh, we're gonna take that and we wanna get a distinct list of dates. So when I run this piece here, what it's giving me is 
uh, a list of all the dates worth of data we have, January 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and this is a vector of strings, right? These are in quotes here, so R doesn't know that this is an actual date. It just knows it as a string of January 22nd, Jan 23rd. And if I run the whole thing, uh, what pool is doing at the end is it's grabbing the month day variable. So now month day levels is equal to that list. And we're going to use this to create a factor when we go to plot. Now the steps to make an animated plot, first we have to make our static plot. Uh, so we're going to take, uh, the one last data step we're going to do uh, before we plot it is we're going to change the way that month day is encoded uh, and we're going to make it a factor. Right? So we're going to make it with levels where the levels are going to go from January 22nd to May 3rd. And what this does is, without calling this a date, we're going to let R know what order we want our days to appear. Because we don't actually want this to print as a date. I want it to print as just the text it is here. But I, by, by doing it as a factor, I'm telling R that January 22nd is going to come first followed by this thing called Jan 23rd, followed by this thing called Jan 24th. And that's what this mutate does. It says, turn month day into a factor where the levels of the factor basically are this list. So these are the things you're going to find. And you're going to label this factor with all of these things that you find. Now let's create a plot. Right? So we're going to uh, start with our leaderboard data. We're going to save the output of our whole pipeline here to something called static. And we're going to pass this little manipulation we've done to create month day. We're going to pass that on to ggplot. And <clears throat> we're going to tell that we want the uh, rank, the country's rank, to be on the x-axis. And the, uh, we're going to group it by country. And we're going to do the coloring, both how we fill it in with color and how we outline it with color. Fill with color, outline with color. We're going to do that by country. And uh, the geom that we're going to add is something called a geom tile because it makes the uh, race look a little bit nicer. So let's go ahead and grab our static plot here and just do this piece. Um, it's going to add a few different geoms here. I'm going to show you what it looks like first. Oh, it, we can't see it because I assigned it to static. So let me say, show me static. And gosh, does this look ugly. Uh, what it's showing me is I've taken all of my uh, data. I've made plots for every day, essentially, and I've just overlaid them on top of each other. It's a, I, I can't use it as a static plot, but it's going to be the building block I need uh, when I want to animate this. So the pieces I have here is I'm calling to a plot. I'm saying, put the rank on the x-axis. Put the group it by country and fill it by country. And we're going to make this thing called a geom tile, which is going to give us our bars. And I'm also going to add to it the uh, um, uh, two other geoms for text uh, that uh, are going to look like, let's go back to here. Here's one geom for text we're going to add. We're going to add the number of cases at the end of every bar, and we're going to add the country over here on the y-axis. Now, this is a little bit of trickery because um, these two pieces of text, they're not, um, uh, certainly this one is not the axis. It's not part of the axis. I'm actually going to tell ggplot to get rid of the axis altogether because I want this thing to be moving. So I've replaced the axis with this text object that's going to move. And I'm going to add this other geom, which is going to be the count of my uh, cases per day. So in the one, I'm saying geom text. And I want you to paste the country name plus a few spaces, which is really just a, a, a trick to be able to uh, have China followed by a few spaces here so it doesn't crowd my bars too closely. And then I have the other geom text, which is going to be placed at the, like how far out the cases go, plus a little bit extra, plus 50. Why 50? I, I played with it for a few minutes until it looked the way I wanted it to look. Uh, but that's saying the placement should be go out all the way for the number of cases, and then a little bit extra. This, is, this is actually turns out to be 50 extra. So the placement of this number, the placement of that text, is cases plus 50. 
So I'm adding to my plot my tile, which is my bar, my, uh, and my two pieces of text, which is my country label and my cases label. I'm going to flip the coordinates, right? So I'm going to go from having my rank on the X to actually flipping it up to be on the Y, and then I'm going to reverse the scale. Now everything else that comes after this is just extra stuff to make the plot look nice. And as I've said every week, this is where I want you to start going in and turning things off and on to see what it looks like. Well, what happens if I get rid of the theme minimal? What does it make my plot look like? What are the other themes that I could uh, use? All right, so you can start going theme and seeing that theme minimal is just one of the many built-in themes that you could be using. So you should try replacing theme minimal with theme dark and seeing what that looks like. So I'm going to separate this today because I, this isn't core stuff that we need to learn how to do, except this last piece in our labels. In the subtitle, we're going to put this placeholder for uh, closest state, and it's going to go with our transition to be able to tell us uh, what the day is for each plot that we flip through. So let's go ahead and run this whole thing. It's going to create our static plot called static. This is our now our object in our environment called static. And again, if I print this, uh, it is not going to print. I think it's even down here. Uh, it's, it's not going to print very uh, pretty. There's nothing here we're going to be able to use because this is overlaying all of our plots onto each other. To be able to see them separately, we need to animate it. And we need to animate it by day. So we're going to take our static plot. We're going to add some transition states. We're going to say the transition should be on the month day. And if you remember, we have our leaderboard month, day, and uh, we have all of the, the days here of our plot. So we're going to make our transition on the day. So we're going to cycle through all the days worth of plots. And transition length state, these are just parameters that you need to fiddle with until you find something that looks like uh, you want it to look. As I said before, ease AES is also another one where you would say, well, what even is ease AES? What are the parameters that I could use? I can use uh, question mark, ease AES, and I can look in the help file, and uh, it's going to tell me that different, uh, the different styles that I could use, uh, the different easing functions uh, that I could use to make it look a little bit different. So I'm going to go ahead and run that, and it's going to uh, save it to an object called animate. Let's try to run this real quick. So it's rendering, uh, it's rendering this object for me, stitching together all these frames. And let me pop this out so it's a little bit easier to see. Now it doesn't quite, it doesn't have the dimensions that I want. It's going a little fast for my taste. So we're going to need to play around with this, but it has the animation uh, running. So now in the last step, we're going to use the animate function, and we're going to render this to a, uh, uh, a GIF file. And I'm going to say that I want the frames per second to be 10 and the duration to be 50. Again, these are things you would play around with to find uh, the right parameters for you. I wanted a plot that was uh, 1,000 by 600 pixels uh, wide and high. And I chose to render into a GIF, but you could have used the uh, movie renderer as well. When you knit this together, here's what we're going to get. Let's scroll down through all of the work we've done today. Here's our plot that you really can't read. And finally, here is our animated plot that flips by day and shows the race to the top uh, here we are in early February, China out in the lead. And uh, again, behind this, now you know that every day is its own chart. And on every day, there's a ranking of the top 10 countries. And as we go March 5th, 6th, 7th, it's a new ranking of countries every day. And we did that manipulation piece. And the animate function is now uh, stitching all of this together for us and making a nice little uh, uh, animation that embeds easily in our website here. So the last thing I'll say is that uh, to build this site all together, you can go to the uh, uh, Build tab and click on Build Website. If you don't see that for some reason, come up here to Build and go to figure, Configure Build Tools. 
and go to build tools and choose website as the option. Right? And the directory should be my website that was created for us. So just go to uh, build, build tools, website. That gives you this build website button. When you create that, uh, when you hit that, it's going to go ahead and render your website for you. Now it's going to take a little bit long for our last piece to make our animation again. But that's what we need to create a bunch of files. All the files here in underscore site, everything in here is what we need to publish to the web. Now to do that, uh, you need to take these files and uh, host them somewhere. Now you've seen me use GitHub a good bit uh, in this workshop series. You could create a GitHub repository, which is free to do. It's super simple. Basically, you put these files into your GitHub repository, and you can turn that into GitHub pages, essentially. Uh, and on there's there's great tutorials here. You can you can click on here to to see how to do this. But it's a few clicks, honestly, to turn it into a website. And then the next step you want to do, if you want to be super fancy, is you can go to GoDaddy or uh, Google Domains, uh, buy a domain like you know. Uh, www.mywebsite.com, which is, I'm most certain, taken. Uh, but you could buy a domain and link it to your GitHub pages. So then when anyone goes to mywebsite.com, now they're going essentially behind the scenes to your GitHub repository. And what's being served up are these, are these pages here. And that's how your website is served uh, online um, almost, almost for, for free. So that's it for today. You learned how to make uh, an interactive plot with one line of code, ggplotly. Uh, you learned how to use gganimate to take a static ggplot object and make it into a slick animation. And uh, with two lines of code, we created a website and you learned how to embed some cool things into your website. See you next week for maps.